In my work as a peace builder, one behavior I've discerned is that the excluded will force their way in in any way possible to meet their basic human needs. Some basic human needs are about water, food, shelter, paycheck. People will fight for those things because they're desperate for survival. But just as important are the human needs for respect. Just as important as sustenance needs. It's amazing how important they are, but you see it all over the world. People fighting for their religion, their national identity, their culture, their language. We want to preserve those things. It's who we think we are. And so people fight for their communities. The experience of being respected and having human dignity is essential. It's the, the opposite is being ignored and humiliated. And that, I think, has more power over people's lives and their memories than rational arguments. Because that's in the gut. That's, that's kind of first chakra stuff. It's very primitive. And it's very powerful. That acknowledgement, that need for recognition that need for respect, for dignity. Hate and bigotry grow out of fear. They don't arise in a vacuum. Nothing, no behavior arises in a vacuum. There's, it's fear-based. Fear grows out of exclusion. When I'm pushed out, I'm frightened. The bottom's fallen out for me. Feelings arise from experiences on our base and unarguable perceptions. You can't argue perceptions. We've seen that in this election. You can't convince people by perceptions. And we've marginalized a lot of populations. Culture, their visibility. And we ignored our own people. The working class, the Rust Belt, other regions. Dist has become a shorthand vocabulary word. It's not in the dictionary, dist, but it's a word that everyone's using. African Americans white working class Americans, Mexicans, women, Muslims, all minorities experience being dissed or disrespected and humiliated. Remember, it was an Arab fruit vendor in Tunisia who immolated himself several years ago out of his own desperation being dissed, not being able to make a living, not being able to hold his head up, which sparked the entire Arab Spring country after country of people feeling dismissed, invisibilized, undignified, fighting for their rights. So sooner or later, the humiliation seeks a victim, someone to blame. The excluded demand their place at the table, and this election is a case in point, as strong a case in point as we can get. Let's focus now on the great turning, which is the third view of stories of the world. It is a time of transition toward a life-giving, sustainable society. It shows up in holding protest actions, in creative endeavors to build a new society, and in shifts of consciousness. And I'm going to talk about all those three. We have had other great turnings. The first one was probably the agricultural revolution. The second one, people say, was the industrial revolution. We are now at the beginning, I think, of a sustainability revolution. Globally, inclusively, and respectfully, if we wanted to succeed. Holding actions are Standing Rock, the Keystone Pipeline in Massachusetts, shutting down Vermont Yankee in Brattleboro, protesting the new pipelines, fighting for legal regulations, for gay marriage, for immigrant rights, for trans rights, for voting protections, and most deeply of all, for climate. We cannot give up on climate change. It's already under attack. But as we, as we dismantle, as we do holding actions, we also have to be doing creative actions because we have to build a new society. And if we can't name it and envision it, it's really hard to build it. I recently worked with a group of Israelis and Palestinians, and at the end of the workshop, it was a nonviolence training, we asked them to go into their separate groups, Israelis one side, Palestinians the other, and to each group talk about the future that they want to see for their communities. An hour later, they came back empty. 
neither side could imagine peace. The Palestinians said, we were born into occupation. We can't picture in our minds a life without occupation. And the Israelis said, we were born as occupiers. We became conscious, even if we're 60 years old, we became conscious 50 years ago as occupiers. So it's been 50 years, and we can't imagine peace. And what we're saying is in building the new society, we have to use our imaginations. And we've done some things. The women's movement is probably the biggest case in point for us to think about. But there's food co-ops, sustainable agriculture, restorative justice programs, alternatives to prison, solar and wind farms, negotiation and mediation processes, the Occupy movement, the ethic underneath Standing Rock as a way of resisting, the Black Lives Matter actions, alternative health care, global human rights, and institutional developments like the EU and the UN. So we're, we're doing it. We're moving ahead. As we're taking down the old, we're building up the new. We need institutions and safety nets and communities of solidarity that include everyone, absolutely everyone, because anyone who was left out is the next spoiler. So the third of these intertwining circles, besides holding actions and new structures, is shifting our consciousness. That's a very interesting task. The consciousness we have now that the earth is alive, a living and sacred system in need of protection and respect. The living system of our air and our water, our winds and our climate will also erupt when disrespected, just as we do as human beings, which is kind of an interesting analogy. I think part of the crush of this election for us is that it indicates a shift of direction that is anathema to most of us who are longing for a more inclusive, tolerant, and progressive future. I feel like we've been literally smacked down. Our precious dreams of a multicultural, cultural, multiracial, cosmopolitan, affirming, climate protecting, open bordered and just world has been attacked and rejected. I got emails yesterday from former students in Sri Lanka and Liberia saying that offensive, racist, and sexist language is being used in their countries today because they're saying, if the US can do it, we can do it too. It's terrifying. And we know that the right-wing governments in Europe are also allied with what's happening here and taking hope. Hungary, the Netherlands, France are all taking hope from what happens here. So this is a this is a global virus and a very dangerous one. We were never a perfect role model, but we've just been demoted very badly. So in rising up, how do we hold on to our values to not hate when we are hated? to respond as Martin Luther King taught us with nonviolence and with love, especially when so much progress that seems so close is now out of reach. But if we are honest and we look back, the week before the elections, black men were being shot in the streets. Refugees had no place to go. The climate crises were multiplying and voting protection rights had already begun to fall apart. We were needed last week before the election and we're needed even more now. So our first task is to regain, regain our faith, our hope, and our direction. But every, every other people felt left out too, and we see that in the election results. I think Bernie tried, and he talks about a new revolution, and I want to add the word consciousness to any revolution, because I think our change of consciousness is required to build bonds to accept our differences and act on our commonalities, to find our commonalities with working people around the world, with scared people around the world, with people who may look racist to us, but underneath are terrified. When we find that terror, we find a way to connect. How do we disarm ourselves from our own attitudes? President Obama tried so hard in his eight years to change his polarization. We have to pick that task up now. 
it can be a bridge too far to span. Mother Teresa said our troubles begin because we draw our circles too small. So I want to ask you to do an experiment for a minute. Make a circle with your arms. And ask yourself, who's in your inner circle? Who's there for you? Parents, children, partners, friends. Who's in there? Take a look. Take a look at who's left out of your circle. Who's not there? See if you can open your circle a little bit. Who are you going to put in? Who do you include this time in a little bigger circle? Who's still left out? Who is outside your circle? Can you go bigger? Can you go bigger? Can you imagine a full inclusion? Taking in all the people you were taught to hate and fear. Taking in all the people you have been opposed to. Taking in all the people you don't know, whose values may be different than your own. How wide can you stretch, stretch in respect and compassion? Thank you. So, we're given these tools for consciousness. We have to use them. I'm going to end with Clarissa Pinkola Estes again for a bit of spiritual mystery to offset the pragmatics of elections and to have the last word. As you will hear in the lines that I read, she talks about soul. We don't have to unpack the meaning of soul to catch the significance. Her connotation to me is full consciousness, a great big dose of humility. And from that the chance to scale up our visions and actions, to take this soul force, what Gandhi called Satyagraha, into the world for a next step in life-affirming and more fully inclusive revolution. Here's what she wrote. One of the most powerful actions you can do is to intervene in a stormy world, to stand up and show your soul, to display the lantern of soul in shadowy times like these, to be fierce, and to show mercy toward others, both are acts of immense bravery and greatest necessity. Thank you.